Hi folks, welcome back to English 306 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. And in this uh, lecture, we will be diving once again into Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. A little number called Show and Tell. Uh, so here's what we'll be getting into in this chapter. Uh, we'll talk about this supposed separation between words and pictures. So you've got words, <laughs> you've got images... Uh, what is the relationship between those two things? Uh, we'll get all into that uh, in the world of art and literature as well as in the world of comics. And so one of the interesting things McLeod gets up to in this chapter is categorizing uh, the different kinds of relationships you can have between words and pictures. I've never seen it done anywhere else other than McLeod. Uh, so it's pretty interesting stuff. Uh, although it comes up, uh, believe it or not, in uh, technical and professional communication uh, because there we deal a lot with um, uh, illustrations, diagrams, uh, when you're making instructions you might want to have screenshots uh, to go along with your instructions in the manual uh, or if you make a YouTube tutorial video the same kind of stuff comes up. You know, What should you show and what is it okay just to tell uh, the viewer is happening or do you want some combination of showing? And telling. So you can see this, this has a lot of applicability beyond just the world of comics. Uh, okay, let's uh, start with a question along those lines. So think about a communication situation. It could be comics, but anything else. And I often think about those little pamphlets that you get when you fly somewhere uh, about safety, and they'll tell you about what to do, and you know, in case the uh, these uh, oxygen masks pop out of the <laughs> ceiling panel. <laughs> just says, okay, it's okay in that situation. Just to panic. <laughs> no, of course not. Uh, they have uh, basically cartoons, comics in there uh, that describe like how to put the mask on, and that, or they tell you to put the mask on yourself first, and then worry about your kid or your, you know, if there's somebody sitting next to you that needs some help. Uh, so they have all that told in the form of words, but it's really through those pictures. And I'm pretty sure that one of the reasons for that is that if it were, you know, uh, some kind of situation where those masks come down, uh, everybody's going to be freaking out. And nobody's going to be calmly looking at a pamphlet. You know, and they can't sit there and read like fine prints. <laughs> and so they have a combination of uh, friendly images and some nice big lettering. Uh, so it'd be easy uh, to follow along with those instructions, even given that uh, predicament. And so that's kind of an extreme scenario, but uh, I just want you to think about any situation where it would be good to have not just text, not just drawing or a photo or something, uh, but some combination of the two. Uh, so think about that, and then we'll get back to uh, McClellan. Okay, moving on, and then into the McLeod. Uh He's got this fun example of <laughs> showing not telling with kids. You know, you learn so much from kids. Uh, if you have some little brothers or sisters or maybe a kid of your own, uh, when they start learning to talk and learning how to communicate, you know, you'll see these things that McClown's talking about. Uh, you know, they'll shift back and forth between, like, look at what I'm doing here and listen to what I'm saying. And so the words and the, the hands-on, I guess, uh, communication, is there's always, uh, you know, it's always going back and forth. It's not... Uh, just all or one. And same thing in these comics. He talks about how, well, and in culture generally, he does get in back to this old, uh, you know, what do you call it, a soapbox about how people don't really respect comics still. Uh, they see uh, these books with pictures in it as being appropriate for little kids, not being appropriate for adults. Uh, yeah, the, the real books have no pictures at all. You know, always think about a Alice in Wonderland and you know, Alice says, you know, what good is a book with no pictures in it, you know? Exactly. Uh, but uh, I think we mentioned this before, that as soon as you leave uh, the West, you know, America and Europe, and go to basically any other country, uh, they don't have this kind of silly uh, idea, you know, and you find plenty of adults reading comics. Uh, in Japan, for example, they call them a manga. Uh, but there's just no... You know, it's nowhere nearly like it is here, where even though here it's changing somewhat, I mean, you go to a comic book store and you're, you you got to be surprised to find anybody <laughs> under the age of 30 in there these days. 
Uh, but yet there's still this kind of lingering idea. We certainly see it in education. Um, he talks here about how if you go to these caves in like France, you can see that some of the pictures will be very realistic, like this horse here. Uh, but then they're also using these more abstract images. You know, we talked last time about how, you know, as people get used to looking at these drawings, you know, this is probably like hundreds and hundreds of years of people making these uh, drawings in these caves, maybe even longer than that, who knows. Uh, but when you first start out, you know, if it's not, if it doesn't look like a horse, you'd just be like, what, what is that? I have no idea. Uh, but over time, as people get used to it, and you've got somebody there to say, oh, look, that's a horse, you know, this, it, now it's just a, you know, a couple of lies, a triangle, and some um, <laughs> sticks coming out the top. <laughs> uh, you know, at this point, people have, have been accustomed to seeing it so often uh, that they don't need to have all that detail anymore. They can just kind of do a little shorthand uh, version of that ox head, and everybody will know what it means through the social conventions. You know, parents telling their kids what it means, friends telling their friends what it means. Uh, the artist no longer has to spell all that out for you. Um, okay. Yeah, here he's talking about how modern writing doesn't have anything to do anymore with, like, the ox head over here. So this, you know, what happens in these writing systems is kind of interesting. So a lot of people think it's... Uh, like with these Egyptian hieroglyphs, they, they look at this and they say, well, this must mean like a duck, something to do with ducks and something to do with the, uh, I can't even tell what some of this stuff is. But uh, anyway, if we just focus in on this duck for a minute, uh, or you look over here and you say, oh, this must be like a jaguar. Oh, this must have something to do with jaguars. Uh, but what they find is that um, even though they used to think that about these hieroglyphics, it's actually not the case. You know, what happens is these are just sounds. Uh, so it would be just like the letter A or B or, you know, C is like, you know, so it, uh, it really has nothing at this point to do with this duck uh, other than maybe uh, whatever the Egyptian word for duck, maybe it starts a certain way. And so they use that sound. Uh, but anyway, the point is you get away from any kind of direct representations. So this is not a, actually a picture of a duck. You know, it's, it's basically like a letter of the alphabet. Uh, and this is the way these uh, written languages go, although there are still some traces of it, you know, in some of these uh, some of these written languages, you can still see a little bit left of that uh, origin you know, where it did, you know, look like the thing it was supposed to represent. Okay, let's see. Moving on a little bit, uh, yeah, here he he gets into like art, the world of painting, basically, and sculptures. During the think about during the Renaissance. It was really important to have like these really realistic looking photos and the sculptures were magnificent. Uh, and the idea was look how closely we can make, you know, look how realistic we can get with like the sh the shadows and the light and, you know, the textures and, and like new kinds of paints, uh, three dimensionality. So it's now, now it looks like you're looking through a window. Uh, you're looking at a painting, but it looks like a window. You know, it's just very, very vivid, very lifelike. Um, and at the same time that was going on in, in the world of literature and poetry, uh, they were getting, uh, you know, more and more uh, abstract, I suppose. So like the, the, the paintings are getting more realistic and the writing is getting more uh, abstract. Uh, but then, you know, as time went on, um, these things started to diverge again. So that now in this abstraction era, or I guess modern art, uh, you stop trying to make it look realistic and it becomes, uh, again, I'm pretty sure we talked about this last time, so I won't belabor the point. Uh, but the art world kind of got more and more abstract, kind of more about ideas. Uh, you know, you look at the painting and you're like, what? There's a good example here somewhere. <laughs> like Picasso. You know, you're looking at Picasso and most people are like, what the heck is that thing? You know, I can't even make out what this is. And that's because it's not trying to look like a photograph. You know, it's just trying to get some idea across uh, some feeling or mood, some ref some kind of um, artistic expression of an internal uh, process of some sort. But at the same time that was going on, the world of uh, fiction again became more and more realistic. The series started to get these uh, novelists who were, you know, they, they're basically giving you like the inside <laughs> thought processes of somebody. Uh, the novels got away from that really sort of um, conventional uh, 
you know, basically unrealistic, stylized uh, sort of situations where the characters were just like uh, stereotypes. And I started to get away from those into these novels like Hemingway's, for example, or uh, George Orwell's, another good example, uh, where you really feel like these are real people. Right? I mean, it's, it's uh, the way these stories are told. Um, it feels like you're inside the person's mind. It's, it's uh, very uh, realistic. Uh, not... Um, so, you know, I like what McLeod does here. You know, it's kind of fun to think about the world of art goes one way, the writing goes the other way. You know, I think I mentioned last time, I'm surprised McLeod doesn't ever point this out. But I think it has to do with the photographs. I mean, once you can just go out and snap a photo, uh, why do you need a painter to, like, spend all that time trying to make the, you know, the why make a painting that looks like a photo? <laughs> it just doesn't, you know, you kind of want your medium to do something that's not easily done uh, with some technology. Uh, right, so writing... You know, at least as of yet, we can't really have a computer that just spits out a really good novel. Um, I'm not sure I'd want to read a novel by a computer anyway. Uh, but it, but it's just kind of interesting things to talk about. Uh, yeah, there's this the Dada stuff where they take... Uh, I'm not even sure what this is. Symbolic, calligraphic, calligraphic meanings. Or... Uh, yeah, here's this pipe image again. This is not a pipe. You know, so they kind of get what they call self-referential. They're kind of basically just having some fun, uh, being creative, being playful, these combinations of words and uh, images. Okay, moving on then. All right. Uh, so, yeah, he, he talks about how the, the art world and the world of novels and writing you know, they kind of went their own ways, and there's been some overlap over the years. But really, where you see this happening uh, is the world of comics. I will just say, though, you know, I always think about an example. One of my students did her master's thesis on uh, covers of magazines. And she, she was looking at men's health and women's health magazines and looking at the words that would appear on those covers and the images that would appear on those covers uh, and she really got into like how close the words were to the images and what were the images of. She had like she had, had a like a classification system, so like a sexy image or like a strong image. You know, I forget the details, but uh, she was kind of applying, you know, looking into the same sort of stuff McLeod is here with comics, but she was talking about these, you know, magazine covers. Uh, so my point is basically we we could apply this stuff again beyond the world of comics. You know, it's really just rhetorical techniques. It's communication strategies, is that really what we're talking about? Okay. So anyway, in the comics, it certainly is a medium where you have a lot of uh, words to read. So there's a lot of reading, uh, but at the same time you've got a lot of drawing, a lot of pictures. So it really is a medium where these two. It, it's probably safe to say this is the medium where you get the most or the closest relationships between writing and drawing. You know, I think that's safe. I can't think of another medium uh, that does this as much. A lot of, uh, you know, I was thinking about video games, and there was a point, if you think about, like, the first Legend of Zelda game, you know, there's a little bit of text in that, you know, uh, it's dangerous to go alone. <laughs> Take this. <laughs> you know, so you get a little bit of text to go with the graphics. Um, but then, you know, as you get later and later, there's, of course, a lot more text in those games, but now, now I'm kind of curious. I'd like somebody to write a paper where they applied these these uh, combinations to, to video games. That would be interesting to see. But anyway, let's go through each one of uh, McLeod's um, combinations here. And some of these, as usual, he, he says later that, look, it's not like every time. It's just absolutely crystal clear which combination it is. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Sometimes you just can't really tell. Uh, so try not to get too hung up you know, on being, like, really discreet uh, with these uh, categories. Uh, but nevertheless, the point is not so much 100% uh, accuracy with it. It's, it's just to get you thinking about sort of the different relationships you might have between uh, writing and drawing. And so that's really the point. And you have to think, too, about the rhetorical and communication value. All right, so first we have the, what he calls the word-specific combination where pictures illustrate but don't significantly add to a largely complete text. And so what he means uh, by this is that you should you should be able just to read the text and it's like 99% of the meaning is there in that text. Uh, you don't even need the picture. Uh, the picture is might, might be there to kind of illustrate 
Um, but it's not like it's it's not going to be the dominant thing, uh, the important thing uh, in that panel. And so if we look at these examples here, it's very, relatively clear. So we stumbled back to the apartment shortly before dawn, vomiting every 20 yards. So that there's a lot of meaning conveyed in these words. You know, we stumbled back to the apartment. So we got this information there, the vomiting, the action every 20 yards. Now, quite a bit of detail packed into just one sentence. Uh, but the picture is just, you know, I don't even know if I'd know what this was if I didn't have that text. It's just kind of a, some gloop on a sidewalk. You know, I don't even know if I'd know this was a sidewalk. <laughs> you know, if you look at it, it's just kind of lines and some blobs. Uh, you'd have a hard time if you didn't have that text and you're just looking at these blobs trying to figure out what the heck is going on here in this panel. Uh, good luck with it. You probably wouldn't be uh, <laughs> able to figure it out. So the word spe uh, specific again, it's really the words are what's special. You know, think about special. Like here, uh, the words are special. Words are what's special. Uh, the picture is not really all that relevant. All right, second type is just the same idea as word specific, but we're just doing the exact opposite. So now the pictures are what's special and the words are there. You could take it or leave it. The words are just adding a little bit of a illustration, if you will. Um, he talks about them like a soundtrack almost. Uh, but again, you don't need those uh, words in these kind of panels. And so here we have one. There's not even any words in there. It's just a picture. Uh, the next panel is, uh, he did it. Yeah, so you, you, you don't even need the he did it. If you just look, okay, so there's a bowler. You know, it's, it's pretty detailed. You can make out what it is. You can see the pens. <laughs> you, could, you can use your imagination a little bit to figure out, like, what happened there? Oh, yeah, he's bowling. He knocked the fence strike, you know. Uh, the he did it. It really doesn't convey much useful stuff. You know, you, you don't need that to figure out what's going on. Uh, this one's a little be even better than this. You got these two lovers here, and they're kind of getting closer and closer. And then the third panel there, yep, they're uh, making out. And there's some hearts, and the uh, words are just one letter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so hopefully that's clear enough. Uh, the pictures are what's special. Uh, the words are just kind of there's flavor or fluff. All right, then we get into the... One that's, to me, the most confusing one is duo-specific. So in this case, the words and the picture or the drawing is the same. So they're basically conveying the same message just using their own, you know, different ways. You know, somebody drawing a picture has a different way to convey meaning than somebody writing. Uh, but, again, it's a little, this is the hardest one, I think, because it's some, you know, I don't, I'd kind of argue that, you, it's never going to be the exact same, uh, no matter what you, what words and pictures you're talking about. Uh, but nevertheless, that's what McLeod is trying to get at here. So if we look at this example, grim-faced George lifted his lollipop. And then if we look at the picture, there's, I guess, George, or a man anyway, lifting up a lollipop. So, your mileage may vary on this one. I just find that one the most <laughs> confusing. Okay, let's see, what are we up to now? Three, a fourth type is called the additive combination. And so this is an old rhetorical concept called amplification. And so you can have a uh, something told in words, and then there's a picture that sort of ratchets up that meaning of that, or amplify, they call it amplify it or elaborate on it somehow. Uh, or it could be the other way around. Uh, and again, this is not the clearest concept, but if you look at this example... Uh, my head feels like a smashed pumpkin. You know, so that's what he's thinking. And then there's a picture of a guy kind of holding his head. It looks like he's got a hung, it looks like he's hung over or something. And there's like some of those little lines we talked about. So you could look at the picture and think, yeah, that guy looks pretty miserable. Looks like he's got a headache or something. Uh, and then we look at the text and it says, my head feels like a smashed pumpkin. Uh, so you can see how this, you could say the picture kind of amplifies this, this, this message, these words. Uh, by showing it to you, uh, or you could say it was the other way around. But anyway, the idea here is it's not exactly the same message. Like this is talking about a smashed pumpkin. We don't see a smashed pumpkin uh, in this picture. It's not a drawing of a smashed pumpkin. Okay, uh, it's a different. Uh, you know, it's a drawing that 
sort of amplifies that message but doesn't try to convey the exact same message and so maybe that maybe that will help uh, this other one is uh, the called the parallel combinations where you basically got one thing going on with the words and another thing going on with the pictures but they're not intersecting you know, it's like parallel lines you know they're doing their own thing example here talk to bill yet yeah, sally did why the test results came back all negative really that's great well and then there's the picture though just somebody kind of like a monk or something walking across a I'm not sure what we're looking at there. Maybe a temple. It doesn't really seem to have anything to do with those words. And so that's just called the parallel combination. Uh, the other type there is montage. Uh, one of my favorites. And this is where the words are treated as parts of the picture. So the words are kind of drawn. The letters are kind of drawn as part of the picture. You say, what's, where does the art and end and the writing begin? I don't know. It's a montage. That's what this technique is all about you know happy <laughs> you got a the letters there h p p y then there's like a, a guy that looks happy <laughs> and so this, this is a really fun one this is the one that the, the uh, i guess the, this da da artist likes so much kind of blurring those boundaries between what's writing and what's drawing uh, and then the last one and he says this is the most common type the interdependent where words and pictures go hand in hand so you can't, if you take the pictures out, or if you took the drawing out, you wouldn't have the same message. If you took the uh, writing out, uh, you wouldn't have the same message. They, they need each other um, to make a coherent message. So the, he's, this top one here we've got, let's look at the text first. It says, meanwhile, dot, 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 and there's some dialogue. Did anyone see you? Okay, that's the writing. And then the picture We've got a ashtray, <laughs> some cigar, a cigarette in it, some smoke coming up. It looks like a hand and a coffee cup. I'm guessing this is coffee, and it looks like there's people probably sit seated at a table. Uh, okay, so you can see there how the uh, if you just had that, if you, if you took the words out, you really wouldn't have much going on there. You wouldn't be able to make much sense of it. Uh, if you took the drawing out again, it would you would remove a lot of the context. You know, if it's just, did anyone see you? I mean, that could be anywhere, any anything. Could be some people out in outer space somewhere saying that. Uh, might be uh, some other kind of creature. Could be a computer talking to <laughs> to itself. <laughs> You'd have no idea. Uh, you really need the picture and the uh, text to get any sense. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Uh, same thing with this guy in this his hand. This is all I need to stop him. So you wouldn't know what this was. Uh, if you didn't have this drawing, because you see the in the drawing, you can see it's the guy he's looking at his his hand. Uh, I guess it looks like maybe he's growing a little fur on his hand. I don't know. Is he a werewolf? I, I don't know. But at least I get some sense of what's going on by this this combination of words and images. All right. So those are the types he talks about, and he uh, says there that again, yeah, interdependent combinations aren't always an equal balance. You know, we talked before about sometimes there's amplification going on, parallel or additive. You know, it could be some degree of that. But generally speaking, the more is said with words, the more the pictures can be freed to go exploring and vice versa. So if you make it clear enough what's going on in the writing or, or the text, then you can have a little more fun with the pictures. Or you can do it the other way around. But, <laughs> you know, you got to have some meaning there somewhere. If it's just totally disconnected, then... Uh, people have a really hard time following a, you know, maybe even you don't know what you're saying at that point. So he gives some examples there. And these are kind of fun. Like, <laughs> you know, there's uh, comics you can buy uh, where they, uh, you, you get to draw your own pictures inside them. Or sometimes it's the other way around and you get to write your own, your own text in there. You know, Marvel actually used that as a way to find talent for a while. I remember being a kid and looking through some of the comics and they were they would have a panel there like and they would like I said it would either you'd, you'd either write your text in there that you thought kind of made that story interesting or it'd be the other way around I think they used that to actually hire people you know to see who had this uh, sort of word and image uh, design I mean I think that's probably about all there is to say with the rest of this chapter uh, but again, I hope you enjoyed thinking about these uh, words and 
in drawing uh, combinations where you might see this in other places. You know, we talked about instruction manuals and things of that sort. Uh, I, I think a lot about this when I'm doing my YouTube videos because a lot of times it would be very costly. Yeah, or, or if you do any kind of film production, uh, sometimes the showing is really difficult. I mean, if you, uh, it's a lot easier for me just to say, oh, look, <laughs> there's a dragon over there. My goodness. <laughs> and just leave it for you to imagine that uh, than it would be to actually try to show somehow a, a dragon model, you know, uh, some kind of computer generated dragon, who knows. A, a lot cheaper to tell in those situations that then to show. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the showing is what makes things a lot more engrossing. You know, people want to see, you know, what's going on. They don't want you just to hear a narrator, you know, explaining everything that way with words. So you're kind of balancing in the world of film, uh, just like you are in the world of, of comics or instruction manuals or what, whatever the case may be. Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. As always, love to hear your uh, your thoughts on this, comments, questions, whatever you'd like to share. Love to read those, but I will stop it here and see you next time.